Good morning. I'm so glad to be here. Um, so, so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for allowing me to um, show my now smeared mascara face all over your screen. And nothing I can do about it. So, <laughs> um, my name is Jessica. My friends call me Jess. That's just um, how it goes. It doesn't even matter if I tell people that that's what it turns into. So you can call me Jess. Um, I kind of introduced myself earlier. Uh, about oh, five years ago, I wrote a book about my story um, and in light of the gospel and uh, specifically in line with the uh, theme of restoration and how the gospel restores us to Jesus in a way that lets us be restored to the kingdom around us. Um, and so not, a, it's a shameless plug for my book, but if you ever wanna know more about my story, I'm not gonna talk a ton about it tonight, but, or today, this morning, but it's called Chains. You can buy it anywhere that books are sold. Um, it's not very long. It has room for you to journal through. It's very much just a personal walk through my story and invites you into your own. Um, and, but this morning we're gonna, when Michelle told me that the theme was reliance on the spirit, I immediately knew I wanted to talk about Romans 8 um, and teach on Romans 8. It has uh, been really personal to me in the last couple of years, but it has been a really personal text for me um, in where I started and in, in where I feel like God has called me out of is this um, theme of groaning. So we're gonna talk about that um, this morning. Um, but I am very much, uh, believe in interaction when I'm speaking and when I'm sharing. So if you have a question, you can stop me, you can raise your hand, put up some sort of thing and we can talk, but I'm also going to ask questions as we get further into the text and ask you to respond and be in this with me. Um, and, uh, I just want to also say I'm very much not a bootstraps preacher. So, uh, if you hear anything like that, that's not from me. Uh, and I don't believe it's from Jesus either. There's, I don't think there's anything that you need to do or say, or believe to make things right. I think the spirit of God living within you is what allows you access to all the goodness God has to offer. So, um, that's my, that's my, uh, my elevator spiel here, um, as we get into this morning, but, uh, just all, I just want to invite you all to take a deep breath Saturdays as uh, a woman, a mom, a lady, a human uh, can be crazy as everyone wakes up and you're like, why can't we all just sleep for an extra few hours on this glorious morning? So um, deep breaths this morning as we enter in. I'm going to start by sharing a little bit about uh, the beginning of uh, last year. Uh, I know we're all tired probably of COVID stories, but this, uh, as I said, this text has become a new for me again over this last year. Um, so almost a year and a half ago, the world stopped um, for many. And if it didn't stop, it at least slowed way down, uh, became inconvenient, different, new, heartbreaking. Um, and for many, it became quite lonely. And for me, it, it became quite lonely. Um, for me and for mine, our story was maybe a little bit different than others. Um, not in the general experience of it all. It was all the same, trying to figure out what's safe, what's not, what do we do? What don't we do? Um, but the, uh, additional piece is that I'm immunocompromised. I'm on immunosuppressants. Um, it's a mild form of chemotherapy that I will be on for the rest of my life, um, the drugs that I am on and the medication that I am on uh, allow me to move. They make allow me to breathe freely. They allow me to do, um, they make me able to love, able to run, able to move, able to get out of bed in the morning. Um, I have a, a disease called ankylosing spondylitis and what my body does is essentially fuses my joints together in a way uh, that eventually they, they become solid. But in the meantime, they break and bend over and over again. So it's constant pain and the medication slows that process down, but it also messes a lot of things up. Like my immune system is very, very weak. It's, it's that of someone probably 50 or 60 years older than me. We, we always joke that I'm a 38 year old woman stuck in the body of a 90 year old, but um, my, the medication allows me to live a really normal and free, normal and free life. So with the threat of this new virus that no one knew about, um, the choice was 
to either slow way down and and wait and see and watch and and be patient and still um, or go out and potentially contract a disease that I am much more susceptible to receive. Um, and so we chose that. We chose the wait. We chose the isolation in a way that was really significant. Um, for for four months, we didn't see anyone except for the person that dropped our groceries on our on our doorstep. Um, and I waved at them through the window and sent them lots of money and tips for delivering my groceries. Um, uh, and we, yeah, so our entire life, the expression, and so for me specifically, um, for my family, it meant lots of things too, but for me specifically, it also cut down on uh, the expression that I knew of my calling. Um, it's the posture of my heart toward others and interactions. I am the lady that will talk to you in the grocery store line and comment probably uncomfortably on every single thing that you have purchased because like I am trying to like build connection somewhere and I, I can't help it. It embarrasses my family so much. I'm like, oh, I see you have broccoli there. You know, it's nice. I love broccoli. You know, it's, I can't help it. It's part of who I am. Um, it changed, it changed it overnight. I couldn't, uh, peek over the fence at my neighbor because I didn't know what the distance was that was safe or if outside was safe enough. Um, and everything that I felt that I, who I was and what I was given to do was placed on an idol and then completely stalled out. Um, and I believe to think that my life was being put to waste. Before the pandemic, I was ministering, showing up in the homes of others to shepherd and to teach and to love and to hold people, physically hold people and to listen. Um, I was enrolled in school full time in person, uh, learning uh, from my colleagues and encouraging them. I, um, like I said, I fart, uh, what I felt before of my heart singing in places like the grocery store, walking down the sidewalk at restaurants, um, given the opportunity to have a conversation with anything that breathes, to lift up, to care um, with my flesh, with my being uh, that I believed was full for the giving, for the sharing, for the kingdom, for those that have been created to be loved. And now that was told to me to be dangerous. Um, my doctor said, Jessica, it's best if you stay home so that you can be still, still be here when this is over. And uh, my kids were on the phone with us that day when my doctor said that out loud. And it was fear for some of us and devastation for others and so much unknown. So I had two options. I could go off my, bed, my meds and be bedridden for the next year and a half to give my immune system a chance to do what most people do. Um, and I would be stuck in a completely different way or I could be still and wait for God to reveal something different. Something strange happened out of all of that. Um, it uh, wasn't despair as one would think, but I didn't recognize myself outside of those things that I had been called to do, those people I had been called to love, uh, the interactions with my community, people I didn't know at all, anything with breath in its lungs. And as the weeks, uh, the days became weeks, I noticed that I started to hide from my actual reflection. It wasn't just the lack of need found in putting on real clothes or the pounds I gained from the jars of queso that I literally ate per week in the first few months of the quarantine. Um, it wasn't about the isolation from my friends as much as I began to feel completely and utterly alone and apart, even from God. How could he let this happen? How could he leave me with virtually zero ways to act out of my calling? Um, these questions rolled through my mind every day from the moment I woke up until the moment I laid down my head. Uh, one morning I stopped in the mirror and for a moment I caught my face and it had literally been months since I could look at myself, but I caught myself walking by my bedroom mirror, tears rolling down my face, asking God to reveal who I was anymore. I didn't recognize my face without my hair done and my makeup, but also without the ability to be who I felt I had been made to be. 
And I almost audibly heard him say, you are mine and I am with you. Really simple, really, really simple. It hit me and it hit me hard. The next weeks included much prayer, introspection. How long had I believed the only way for me to encounter God was through the beauty of others or through the beauty of his creation? I wondered how long I had forgot the hope and comfort and care and love and things that I had shared with others in his name was also meant for me, regardless of what I could do, how I could interact, how I could simply just be breathing, feeling, sitting. And for the first time in my life, as this went on and as I started to just rest and sit and even just sit and look at my face in the mirror and see God within me, I no longer was afraid of this idea of being alone. Because the first time in my life, I was able to soak in the goodness of God found with just me, just me. I think in our culture, we're taught, and especially in a Christian culture, when, we're, when we are so plugged into this idea of community and being interconnected and living with one another in constant community with one another in order to spur each other on, we begin to easily think that our role is to simply be connected to another in order to experience him. And all that's good and true, and I would never defute that or say that that isn't good and true, but what happens when the world shuts down? What happens when our neighbor is is potentially no longer safe, not in their person, but in, in their breath that we are to share in his name? As this time went on, and as I realized that God could be found within me alone, just me, and that alone was no longer something that I actually even could include in my vocabulary, as I, as I believe that I, I just never simply could be that, that is not a reality for us in him. It started to create this deep communion in me that wasn't dependent on anything else but my desire to see and believe in his presence, in his power, and his personal knowledge of me, of the spirit living within me. Um, my very, very favorite devotional is an oldie but a goodie. And I don't know if any of you have read it, but it's Streams in the Desert. Um, <laughs> I picked it up in every single moment, hard moment of my life. There are pages missing from this thing. I don't, there are days missing because I have ripped through the pages so many times. Um, <clears throat> Every tumultuous and painful season has included the familiarity of these words and they've almost created a melody. I almost always, I almost can know certain months of that devotional. I know what's coming next. And isn't God's voice like that? The more time we spend with him, the more time we spend paying attention to the spirit's presence within us, is there not a familiarity that comes even in the painful series, seasons that creates a comfort? There are a few words um, that I love uh, from Streams in the Desert. It's uh, it's on June 30th. If you're ever if you're ever in the in the book and you're in there, um, and it's really simple. It's talking about our awareness of the spirit within us, and they say. It's almost as if God is waiting in the depths of my being to speak to me if I would only be still enough to listen to hear his voice. I'm going to say it again. That God is waiting in the depths of my being to speak to me if I would only be still enough to hear his voice. Man, when I got to that part of last year, because you know I picked this book up as soon as that pandemic hit, I thought that's it. I took a moment to look in the mirror and sit with myself and recognize the depths of my being included the spirit of a living God within me. And I stopped long enough to hear his voice that said, you are never alone. For the months leading up to catching my reflection, I was running in my mind and my heart, trying to figure out what was I supposed to be doing? <laughs> what in the heck was I supposed to be doing? 
what was this season supposed to mean? And that moment of stillness in the mirror revealed the answer. Whether it was something or nothing, the presence of him within me be what would, is what would make it worthwhile or any kind of good. We, the collective, we as believers, are so quick to believe that we should know. We should know what's going on. We should know what's coming next. We should know where God is or what he would do or what he would have us to do or say or pray or think or believe. And yet within the presence of the good God who supplies us with a presence to lead and to guide, to intercede and to know, we have little to do. And boy, is that terrifying sometimes. But we have much to live in to hope for and to be freed into. The spirit leads us to draw near to God through their indwelling and offers us an invitation for strength as we are emboldened from within ourselves. I just want you to think about that a second. I want you to think about the spirit of the living God. We talk about them all the time. We sing about them, we, we read about them, we speak about them, we pray in the Spirit's name. And yet, do we sit in the wonder of the intimacy of it all? Do you sit in the belief and the knowledge that the Spirit of the living God who created you and knitted you together in your mother's womb resides within you, within you? We're not being um, given strength just externally from a God that reigns from above, but we, we can learn and know and do from the God that lives within, within us. Can you grasp it, even a corner of it? Would you dare yourself later today to look at your face in the mirror and recognize that it's not just you looking back at yourself, wondering who the heck you are and why the heck you're here. The spirit of God that lives within you knows. It's an intimate and intertwined embodiment that we fail to take a moment to pay attention to. Instead, we are quick to believe that we are dis discounted or disqualified. You know, I, I'm talking about this experience of this, this last couple of years and, and thinking that my inability to move outside the doors of my house automatically disqualifies me from experiencing the goodness of God. What? What? If the spirit of the living God lives within me. I can never be disqualified from experiencing the goodness he has to offer to me or to others. In our weakness, the scripture tells us that we can approach God. Let's think about that again. In our weakness, the scripture tells us we can approach God with any need in any way that we feel as we believe in him to be the one who provides with the words in which to live by and the light to walk towards through the power of the spirit, not our own, not our own. So as we participate in this sort of posture and rhythm, we are able to allow the words to abide within us. Those words that we read about the spirits and dwelling within us and the spirit's power to connect us to God and, and, and God's ability to be and desire to be for us become life as they live within our bodies. They aren't just words for us to strive towards. It's real, it's real, it's living, it's active. And out of that, we can pray our true hearts in our need and in our weakness, in repentance, accepting the faith we've been given, not by our own work, but through the goodness that is found with us, within us. So in Romans 8, it speaks to the weakness of flesh. It speaks to the, the presence of the Holy Spirit within us, God's very own spirit. And today, I just want to take a few moments to talk about three things 
the presence of the spirit, the power of the spirit, and the personal knowledge that the spirit has of us. Romans 8 shows, shares many things about the spirit's presence. Um, I'm just going to paraphrase. I'm not going to read the whole scripture. We will read a piece of it, but I'm just going to go back from the beginning and tell you all the things that Romans 8 tells you about the spirit. In verse 2, it says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. That means that all is good and true and worthy is within you and you're free to let go of all of the other things that are still present that distract and destroy. In verse four, the spirit helps you fulfill the just requirement of the law. The spirit helps you. It doesn't say Jessica fulfills the spirit of law and then the spirit comes in to make it good. It says the spirit helps you to fulfill these things in our lack, in the gap, in the places we know that we fail or just can't figure it out or don't even know how to pray or think or believe. In verse six, it says the spirit gives life and peace. The spirit gives life and peace. You don't give yourself life. You don't make yourself worthy. You don't create your own purpose. And, and life and peace go together in the scripture. Not tumultuous chaos, not bewilderment, but out of life also comes peace. According to verse 11, God will raise you from the dead by the spirit who dwells in you. Okay, let's just all hang in there for that. We get caught up in our own sin either by committing it, participating in it, ignoring it, paying too much attention to it, believing this or that about ourselves, about the crap we can't get together. My friend always says, without getting our poop in a group, we can't get our poop in a group. Like, I think there's other words that others use too, um, but it says this, this, uh, God will raise you from the dead by the spirit who dwells in you, not through your ability to get it good and right. In verse 13, the spirit helps you put to death the deeds of the body. All of those things we find within our flesh, our unbelief, our, um, our need to search for more, our desire to mask or escape like Lisa was talking about, the spirit puts those things to death. The spirit does. According to verse 14, the son of God are led by the spirit. The sons of God are led by the spirit. We are led by the spirit. It's talking about us. In verse 15 and 16, the spirit bears witness in us that we are children of God and so gives us assurance of our salvation. The spirit bears witness in us that we are children of God. On those days when you don't know or when others tell you different or when the world is screaming that you don't belong or that you have fallen short yet again, the spirit has done the work to declare you a child of God, assuring you of your salvation. In verse 23, the Holy Spirit is the foretaste and guarantee of our final redemption. That goodness that indwells is the promise of what's to come, holy, without gap. And the verses we're going to spend a lot of time on are verses 26 through 27. The spirit helps us when we don't know how to pray as we should. And that's what I really want to look at this morning. So I'm going to read that passage. Uh, it's Romans 8, starting in a chapter uh, or in verse 26, sorry. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings. Pay attention to that word. That cannot be expressed in words. And the father who knows all hearts knows what the spirit is saying for the spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. I want to move on to talk a little bit about the power of the spirit and how that meets us in that weakness in our weakness that it speaks of i'm going to ask you a question 
as we talk about all of this and as as we hear the the words speak of our weakness i'm just wondering uh what do you think that means or what does that mean for you when we when we talk about weakness what weakness comes to mind when it when it says and the holy spirit helps us in our weakness for example we don't know what god wants us to pray for anybody have any example of that or something that just comes to mind there's no right answers um you could just give me the Sunday school answer of like, I always love the kid that's like, Jesus. <laughs> and you're like, yes, always, but no, like there's more. So let me, let me know. What do you, what do you, what comes to mind when you, when you think of weakness or when you, when you hear the word mention weakness here? Hmm. Um, like for me, I just automatically think about when I'm feeling overwhelmed with the needs of my young children and not sure like I feel like my selfishness is fighting against their selfishness and it's just chaos all around and I'm overwhelmed and like I I'm kind of know how I should handle it and but instead I like yell and get angry <laughs> but really I need to be like like in the whole time the spirit is like come to me come to me i can actually help and I'm like, ah! yeah. um so like that that's yeah yeah <laughs> i call that the holy wrestling match of sin collision that's what i used to call it when i homeschooled my kids so that i hear sounds, you that sounds about right <laughs> yeah when we're that weakness of feeling overwhelmed and not even knowing like like you're saying i i hear the spirit within me saying just slow down and you're like no these kids just need to do the right thing you know and then <laughs> we start to believe that for ourselves right we should just mm. already have been doing the right thing that overwhelmment that's good i like that anyone else i think i might have some in the chat let me see oh. um i was just thinking in our weakness um like sometimes I know when I go to pray, I draw a blank or my mind is so busy with other things that like, I'm a I feel like it is so hard to be still. Like I am so weak when it comes to just like sitting and listening to the spirit. Um, yeah. When I think of weakness, I think like, man, I can't even get my mind still for a few minutes to pray at times. Like that is weak, <laughs> you know? So when I think yeah. of weakness, just that like inability to like, Jesus, I love you and I want to meet with you, but it's so hard sometimes just to be still for five minutes or 10 minutes or two minutes. Um, yeah. And I think of that weakness, like how we need him to just even help us be still for a minute to pray, to like slow down. Yeah, that's yeah. my <laughs> Yeah, that inability to just even sit for one second and take the time to think, oh, if I drew near, you're right here. You're right here. Yep, I hear that. I hear that. Anyone else? I just wanted to say that um, my husband and I were praying for somebody the other day. And can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. And um, we were talking to this uh, man. He's in his 50s and his wife has a mental health issue who's tried to commit suicide many times. 14 in total in the last five years. And while listening to his story, I was sitting there helpless, mm -hmm. feeling so weak, not knowing how to help him. And I just felt myself just breaking down and feeling so weak. Firstly, I was feeling um, weak because I just couldn't understand how he has managed uh, supporting his wife for so long and taking her to the hospital, bringing her back so many times. And then I didn't know how to pray. I just yeah. felt so weak. And I was just, all of a sudden, I felt this groaning from within, this weakness, this sob coming out. And I thought, I just feel helpless. I don't know what to do. But all I know is I can reach out to God and say, come and take over. Yes. Yeah. I think that's really good. Thanks for sharing that. I think 
that is such a huge piece of our weakness, right? Is when we're sitting and listening to the story of someone else, or even with our own circumstance or um, our own day or moment, and not even knowing what it is that could help and not even knowing what words would come in most handy in that moment. Um, that's a sign of our human weakness, right? Of being here in this place. And I think that's really real. It's something that's really relatable. How about one more, anybody else? Well, something that I was gonna say, I really, really love that verse also. And actually what was just said right before this was so good. I think there's been times when it's, kind of like what I said last night, the pain gets so much to where you almost lose, like just kind of lose language. And it's like, I just kind of start being like, spirit, pray for me. I, I, I don't even know what to say. Like, this is like, I have no words, like the human language just like falls short, like to describe what's going on. But in like, kind of in that like weakness of like, don't even know, this is so hard, but I don't even know how to ask for help for myself. But like, but there's almost like this relief a little bit knowing that like okay the spirit knows what to pray for so I'm just gonna okay spirit you know you know what the father needs to hear right now like please just pray for me yeah so there's, a, there's a sweetness almost in like that release of like I don't know but you know so can you do it totally it's really good Lisa So there's a few things that this, these two verses are telling us about our weakness in light of those feelings. And I'm gonna come back to those feelings in a minute, but I'm gonna, I wanna talk first about what the spirit is, is doing. It uses the word, the, the scripture uses the word helps, which is an active word, right? It's not a passive word. It's not helped or will help, it's, it's helps helps us in our weakness, meaning now, right now, meaning present, meaning always, every day, all day. You can't simply simply choose to shrug him off. You know, I think sometimes we believe like, now we're asking God to help. Now we're not. It's like this, this belief that like, uh, God is just this like, um, you know, fluffy puppy that we just bring in for comfort sometimes when we really get in a pickle and don't know what else to do. And, and so, and then not at other times, meaning he's, he's removed and no, like what the scripture is telling us and, and tells us in my, many other places is that the spirit helps us in our weakness, meaning right now, meaning always, meaning if you can ask, if you can't ask, if you have the words, if you don't have the words, if you know what you need, if you don't know what you need, it's, it's, it's all the time. It's all the time. Help means he's active, not passively waiting for us to call on him, but in our weakness, in our strength, on our good days, on our bad days. I also want you to notice the word hour before weakness. It says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. It means all of us. It means all all believers, anyone who has called on the name of the Lord and claimed them as his and allowed them to be his, it's Christians. Those are in, that are indwelled in the spirit. This speaks to, I think, our common belief um, as, as women, as humans, to compare ourselves, to compare our faith to that of another. We watch other people struggle and we're like, oh, they're doing that so good. Like, Oh, like, you know, um, you, you see other people wrestle through things and, and you see pictures and moments of their faith that you so wish you could have. And we get stuck in, in remembering that we all have weakness. He helps us in our, our collective weakness. There is no comparison of who's doing it best of who's more able to get closer to the spirit because the spirit is within us all, living, breathing, active all the time, regardless of our ability to do it well, make it look good, speak to it in the right way, share the story in a way that helps others or encourages or man, even makes sense at all. I think sometimes, you know, we get in these situations where 
we are living through a circumstance and we can start to see the light just a little bit and someone asks how we're doing. And maybe even as you're praying, you can you can start to see how you might be able to share that with someone else. And then when someone else, you just mess, just mess, just, <laughs> or the time when someone asks you how your life is and, and instead of speaking joy and beauty that blossoms from your mouth and speaks of the goodness of the Lord, it's just complaint. It's just what's, what resembles a grumbling, what resembles the dark depths. The spirit is there for us in our weakness, whether it's when we're sharing our flesh or when we're sharing our spirit with the living God who lives within us. The verse goes on to share a very specific sign of our weakness. And this is kind of what we were talking about when I asked you the question. There are times that we don't even know how to pray whether it be what to pray or say or do or how to approach God or how to even get in the scripture. What do I read? What would be most helpful? What would be most spiritual? What, what should I know about what to find in the Bible? Um, and in those moments, the spirit is groaning for us is what this scripture says. The spirit is able to persevere past our own ability to be strong, to know, to do, to be. And this is where we get into that personal knowledge that the spirit has of us. I'm going to ask you another question. When the scripture speaks of groaning, I want to know what, what comes to mind for you when you think of groaning? What kind of sound is that for you? What sorts of things cause you to groan? You know, Carrie's saying when I'm trying to work through something with my kids and chaos breaks out and I'm like, ah, like, she's like, yes, like that is a groan. That is a groan. What sorts of things are that for you in your life? What, what brings about the groan? Um, it, for me, anyway, I'd say power struggle in marriages makes a big groan in my life. It's just... Yeah constant and feels like it's never ending sometimes yeah. yeah that's a big one for me yeah relational grown is a real thing yeah <laughs> um I was just thinking uh that kind of that deep feeling of being misunderstood totally um there's a deep groan there and yeah that's good and maybe some of the injustice that you can feel around the unresolved when there is, when that is happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think for me, I'm a counselor. And so when I work with, I think like 80% of my clientele is 19 and under. So <clears throat> grown when I like, it's that also that weakness in the spirit. Like I, I have nothing to say. I can't help these people. I can't do anything. And I, and I, I hurt badly mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's a hard, it's uh, definitely humbling <laughs> and I'm glad, I don't know how people can counsel without the Holy spirit, first of all. So <laughs> yes. without knowing Jesus. So um, but I, I groan and uh, call out for the, the Holy Spirit and the Lord because it um, can be deeply difficult and painful. Yeah, it's good. Anyone else? Um, I just think of, when I think of groans, I think of, it's like praying in the Spirit. I mean, I think there's times when my prayers are nothing but tears, just weeping yeah. and Feel the Holy Spirit's there because that's how he comes out of my life. I just cry. <laughs> I feel like those are groans of like agony for others or of just, yeah, heaviness of spirit for those that don't know him. And those come out in just groans or praying in tongues or just like, I don't even know what I'm saying at times, you know, where he is at work um, and it's messy and it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I like that messy and awesome. That's good. That's really good, Michelle. Anyone else? For me, I have teenagers, so that is my big groan in itself because there's the mood swings and the up and down and the, you want to help them, but you also want them to do it themselves and you try and provide advice, but then they think that you don't really know anything. So it's just a big groan for me. So yeah, yeah. That's, 
That's me for sure. That resonates. So in this, in Romans eight, we see the word grown used three times. Uh, in verse 22, uh, it says, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And then in verse 23, it says, and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of our future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. And then in verse 26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. We learn a few things, I think, from taking notice of everything that God has created, having the ability and using the, the, the process or the, the sound of groaning to communicate with him, especially that of the spirit. This shows us that God hears us regardless of our ability to make sense, to make well. The spirit groans because they are communicating emotion felt in pain of something held dear to God, the father, the son. And the Lord doesn't just hear these groanings, but he understands them. He understands them. There's a beauty found in the groaning when it's found in the release of our will, right? When we're groaning like Michelle is speaking up and we're just weeping and we're at, at the foot of the cross where we're at the end of ourselves. We've reached the end of ourselves, of our striving, of our trying, of our belief that we should be able to figure it out. There's a beauty found in that groaning as we release from ourselves and release ourselves to the need for our father. It's a sound of utterance, right? That sound of weeping is not one that is um, easily forgotten when we hear it from others. It's not one that is unfamiliar for ourselves when we've reached that moment or those moments. It, it's, it's a revealing of our inability of our weakness, but more importantly, our humanity. And it's a sound that longs for a holy meeting. Creation groans and desire to be restored and renewed to what it was meant to be, right? We read in Genesis of a garden of a, of a perfect holy place where God walked, where you could hear the footsteps of the father. And yet sin has come in and destroyed that created on the farm. We see it in weeds everywhere. Everything's a noxious weed. In our lives, we see it in our inability to, in our belief that we have an inability to find God at times. In our relationships, we see it in our inability to make sense of what the other person is saying or find the grace to take a moment to listen for just a second longer. We groan as we long for things to be made right, to be made whole, to be made good. We groan for comfort, but I think ultimately we groan for companionship as someone mentioned, for someone to understand for someone to say, I, I, I hear you, I'm listening. And the spirit, as we read, groans, as the scripture says, in accordance to God's will, in the gap, making sense out of our brokenness and as out of our need. I just want you to think about that and what that might mean if we truly believed that the spirit takes all of those groanings from our hearts, from our mind, from our body, from our soul, in our relationships, as the spirit is fully present in you, knowing your sins, knowing your escapes, knowing your shortcomings, knowing your messed up beliefs, the things that you continue to hold on to, even though you know there is something better. And out of that comes a groaning 
that the Lord is fully able to understand within his will for you and your life and your experience in this broken world as we wait for him to return. It speaks here specifically of a weakness that does not understand how to pray. And we all touched on that. And if the spirit is within us, operating on its own regard, on their own regard and in line of the will of God, in complete and perfect community with God, the Father, the Son, and themselves, in complete intimacy with whatever is going on in our broken, dirty, messy, beautiful hearts. Our ability to be good, to be well, to be strong is found in the Spirit's full knowledge of who we are and what we've done and what desires we truly have, not in our ability to make sense of it, the Spirit's ability to make sense of it, which we've been promised. Spirit prays for what we do not know we should ask for. The Spirit prays for things we don't know how to ask for because of our weakness or our lack, our sin, our weariness, our bewilderment. The Spirit intercedes. I think in church, we throw that word around a lot, right? We talk about intercessory prayer and praying for one another in, in the gap and reaching out to God for one another. And how beautiful those times of prayer are if you've ever done it, if you've ever been involved in it where, where you are praying out for the heart of another in their name to a God that you know listens and answers. How much more beautiful that the spirit in full intimacy with you intercedes on your behalf. In full knowledge of all the crap you hide, the crap you hide in, the crap you hide from, the stuff that no one ever sees. And yet they still intercede on your behalf in the will of the living God. As a result of this personal knowledge, this form of intercessory, that should be our greatest comfort. As the word tells us that the spirit of the living God within us lives and breathes, but also prays in the gap in our favor. We often get caught up as we've spoken how we should pray. Should we pray? Should we be, should we pray that we be released from the suffering or should we pray that we are strengthened so that we can endure? Have you been there? <laughs> we want to get it right. Surely we know that neither of those is wrong. It's not wrong to pray to be released from your suffering, nor is it wrong to be prayed to pray for the strength to endure. Both are good. And yet, we're still unsure of how God will do it. And I think somehow we're holding on to this belief that if we do it right, it means that God will act appropriately. How pompous of us, of me, thinking that if, at the beginning of this pandemic, if I could just figure out what my new purpose would be as I lived in isolation in my home, maybe I would feel better. Maybe I would be more worthy. Instead of remembering that the God who created the universe, who brought his son to live a perfect life, to sacrifice an unruly and nasty death, to provide me with life that endures, and left his spirit here within me to give me comfort, to give me purpose to give me deep connection. And yet we're still after what will free us and sure of how God will do it, but longing to hold a faith that believes he will. And this is the gap the scripture is sharing with us. The inside scoop, the reveal of the majestic wonder held within the Trinity. Through the indwelling of the spirit, our groaning is brought to the father in perfect understanding 
in full volume with clarity and intimate knowledge of who we are, where we've been, where we long to be, what we need, how we will, how all of this will align with who we have been created to be. And even speaking all that and knowing all that, I have no idea how it works. <laughs> and I don't believe that we're meant to. That's where faith comes in. Isn't it good? Isn't it good? Can we feel it? Can we let go of our need to overcome the weakness and just draw near? We have all that we need to be, to be loved, to be known, to be held. We hear, we read here, and I've said it a million times, we are as full as we will ever be in the intimacy that we hold with the spirit. We have all that we need to be rescued from our flesh that tells us we aren't, tells us we can't, we don't, that we won't, but Jesus working for us, saving us, redeeming us, and working continually to sanctify us to the Lord. The beautiful thing about Romans 8 is it, it, it speaks all to the spirit. And then in verse 24, it says that also Jesus intercedes at the right hand of the Father on our behalf. And here we read that the spirit of a living God not only resides inside us, interceding from within us, but Jesus is interceding for us above. And the two meet in the middle, in the in-between, in the places we do not know. We are being interceded for in heaven and on earth, where we are and where we will be. Amen. I, 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 that wrecks me every time. We can rely on this relationship in deep communion, knowing that we are never alone. There's nothing for us to do. And when we're doing nothing, we're still enough to hear his voice as it listens for ours, even in our growing. So I want to give you some fruits for this, right? What does it mean? What will it look like? What, what does this all say? Here's the fruit that I believe results from this sort of belief, this sort of living. Um, these are the awarenesses uh, and, the, and the desires that come. When we live with the spirit of living God inside us, knowing that, believing that, living out of that, living into that, we, um, we know that we're not expected to know the will of God in our life or in this season. We no longer have to scramble to figure it out. Outside of living in the knowledge that you belong to someone who has created you for love, for care, for joy, for purity, for wholeness, not just to give it to others, not just to serve your community, not just to spread the word of God from here to the nether coast, not just to grow the kingdom, but for you to receive to draw near, to live, to rest, to be still. God knows. God knows his will, and he will make it right. Within this knowledge, we also know that our groaning is understood. Your ability to have the words or even the understanding is not needed for you to hold communion with God. The Spirit does the work of leading you into a space where God is with you, hearing you, and listening to you. Within this knowledge, we know that God is able to do and is doing more than we can desire, expect, or long for. The knowledge you hold of what you need in any given moment does not limit the action of God. Can we say that one more time? The knowledge you hold of what you need in any given moment does not limit the action of God. Amen. Be encouraged that the God of the universe who has created it, within this, we can be encouraged that the God of the universe who created this world, this beautiful place in which we live, and us also who lives within it, prays for you. Your God prays for you in the knowledge of where you are 
of who you've been and who he created you to be. No one, not even you, can want wholeness for you more than he who calls you by your name. And lastly, well, not lastly, but the last point I have right here, you can know and be loved in the knowledge that the spirit is acting in your lack and your fullness. In their indwelling, you are in full communion at all times, regardless of the condition of your flesh. God is who makes you holy. The Spirit's working for your goodness. Your prayers are always heard and always answered. So two last things. One of my very favorite verses in light of groaning or praying or speaking to God is an encouragement for all who try, who makes effort, even if it's just to dare or to risk to believe. It's found in Psalm 116, verse 2. The whole psalm is beautiful, but I'm just going to read you the one verse. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Ladies, can you believe that? And imagine in those moments with your kids, with your spouse, at work, with your clients, if you really believed that God was leaning into you, bending down towards you from the holiest place there is to be, to hear you pray, how would you do it? What would you say? Would you be able to say anything at all? My guess is probably not. My guess is that it would be groaning and tears and weeping and mess. And yet the word tells us he does. I want to leave you with a prayer I've modified and an effort to make it personal. Um, sometimes uh, one of the ways that I deeply connect with God is um, bringing uh, scripture in, into prayer um, and not changing what it says, but changing the, um, the words or the pronouns or the things to make it a personal prayer. Um, and I'd love it if you would choose to pray it sometime today. I'm going to read it for you. It's, uh, it's, it's Ephesians um, 3, another one of my very favorite chapters. Um, and it starts in verse 14. I believe as the body we can use the prayer of affirmation of God's strength and presence um, in this way. And uh, so I'll read it to you in a personal way. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resource, he will empower me with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in my heart as I trust in him. My roots will grow down into God's love and keep me strong. And may I have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May I experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then I will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all God to all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within me to accomplish infinitely more than I might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. I hope that this was encouraging. I so, so thankful I could share with you guys this morning. Thank you for having me.